So um, with that, um, I want to introduce uh, Stacy Higginbotham. Stacy, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am from Texas, so I will say y'all. It is not an affectation. It is just who I am. Um, so hopefully you guys won't, won't mind. Um, and this is Chairman Tom Wheeler, of the FC or Chairman of the FCC. And I just found out that he is a Buckeye fan. And Was there applause back in? <laughs> I'm, I'm like, know. can I hear it for UT? <laughs> There's a. <laughs> I, 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 Wait a minute. Thank you, thank you guys. So um, I think the odds are about even now. We it's, have it's one true. and several. It's good. We're, we're ready. We can handle it. I'm like, is, is one of ours a McCoy? Because, because yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Um, so that that was really the most important fact I learned about Chairman Wheeler in our, in our pre pre uh, conversation conversation. So. I am really excited for this opportunity because I am a huge believer in broadband. And when Chairman Wheeler came, came in and he published his 40-page his kind of discussion about the network compact, man, I read that thing the second it came out. And I was like, oh, yes, this is going to be awesome. Um, so I am super excited. And I thought we should, we should just talk quickly, kind of go over your concept of the network compact. Well, you know, Stacy. Well, first of all, if you want to do Venice, okay, I'm, I'm in. We could do, we could partner up, okay? And, I believe it. And, uh, um, so, uh, I'm a uh, a frustrated um, amateur historian, um, and I tend to look at everything through a historic lens. And, um, and so when it comes to networks, I think we're in the midst of the fourth great network revolution in that the, the lessons learned and the stories that were those earlier revolutions, which were the printing press, the railroad, the telegraph, which then became electronic communications, and now uh, the marriage of uh, high-speed computing uh, and delivery systems. Um, that those kinds of lessons are applicable to us today. And if you look at them, there comes out of all previous network revolutions a series of basic concepts. Um, you have to have access to the network. The networks have to interconnect. There is an important public safety and indeed national security component of that. And that there is a need for some kind of consumer protection, consumer representation in the process. And that's what I call the network compact. And the question becomes, as we move into this fourth network revolution, how will those kinds of concepts continue? For the last hundred years with the telephone network, we've had a, a, a set of rules, a set of operating guidelines, a set of this is what I know, th this is how I as a consumer can expect to interface with the network. As we go to an all IP network, the technology has changed, but the basic compact concepts have not. And so the challenge becomes, how do you port, to use a digital term or a network term, how do you port those concepts over into the new reality? And so what we're going to be doing later this week, Thursday, is uh, we will be voting on an item that lays out a plan for running a series of trials on the impact of all IP on consumers. And, and you know, a lot of people have talked about these as technical trials. They're not technical trials. We do not need, I know it's a shock to you, we do not need, we do not need trials to figure out how to build IP networks. They work. Okay, they work. We know how to do that. What we do need to do is to understand what happens when that's the network. That's everything we're relying on. 
And how do we make sure that those basic values that are in the network compact transfer over? And let's, can you get a little bit specific about the basic values? Sure. Because when I think of, like my house, we built it last year. It has no phone jack <coughs> in it, with the exception of my elevator shaft, which I don't have an elevator in. Um, but it had to have a phone jack because regulations required any elevator shaft to have a phone jack. And I was like, God, my house is strong with Cat6 cable for you know fiber access and ugh, a phone jack. Mm. Uh, so what are what are the things that you guys are focused on as you look ahead to all IP, and what are you looking for in these trials? Um, so, so rule number one of a trial is you don't want to prejudge it by saying, okay, here's what I'm looking for going in. So, 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 but I will tell you that what you want to have is you want to have a measurement capability that establishes a set of metrics that allow you to draw conclusions. And that's what that's how we're going to be be structuring these things. I mean, the the trials will be run by various carriers, Celex, you know, whomever. And what we're going to be saying to them is, God bless, go at it, okay? Use your best judgment, and we want to know the following kinds of things to help in the measurement of what's really going on. So is this things like I can call nine one one from my VoIP line and people will show up, or is this that's kind of table stakes? Right. That, that that's how I feel. <laughs> no, I mean, but I mean, so here, but here's the thing. If we want broadband to grow and flourish, it has to be able to provide services like that. It does. Because nobody's going to sign up for broadband. If they can't get 911, nobody's going to sign up for broadband if their help, I've fallen down button doesn't work, right? And you go through this whole series of things. And so, so, so what we have to do is to say, all right, for broadband to grow and realize its full potential. There are a group of expectations that it has to meet, again, that's the network compact. And it, it's not only in consumer facing, right. but it's in the back end systems. I mean, you know, so interconnection is a component of the network compact. The, the internet, the term the internet is short for the original term, which was internetworking. Right. Okay. Because there is no such thing as the internet. The internet is the result of the interconnection of a series of diverse networks using a common protocol. Right. If those networks don't interconnect, there is no internet. So again, in the trials, it's not just Stacy and, and, and the forward facing of the consumers, but it's also the back end. And how do we make sure that, the, you know, let's go back to the history. Theodore Vail built AT&T by leveraging off of interconnection. Mm -hmm. AT&T ran the long lines, ran, ran long distance, and Vail said to various independent telephone companies, you either sell out to me or you don't get on. Right. We're not going to let that history happen again. Okay. That's not what the future of the internet is all about. So you're jumping ahead a little on something I'm going to ask you about, but... <laughs> Actually, we'll, we'll do it because otherwise it might confuse the issue. So this is something I've actually been writing a lot about because, because in Silicon Valley and the people I write for, this is a huge issue um, that's come out in the last, it has happened since you know, 2007, 2008, but in the last 12 months or so, it has 
gotten particularly bad, and that is this idea of interconnection. And we can call it settlement-free peering, like paid peering. You know, there, there are options, but at places where these networks interconnect, studies have shown that those are the places where problems occur. And for consumers who are at home watching Netflix, they're like, or YouTube, they're, they're, they're looking at their screen and suddenly they can't get anything in HD or it's pixelating. And they, they, they're frustrated and they don't know what's happening. Um, is it their Wi-Fi? So, you know, I can go on Comcast's forums, for example, and I, I can see pages of people being upset. And then I see the technicians responding with, well, we're doing this, but if you're trying to watch Netflix, you know, it could be their servers. Um, so there's the problem of disintermediation. But when I talk to the big providers, they're like, well, it's actually not a problem of disintermediation. It's a problem of where we meet Comcast's network because they're saying to us that if we don't pay either a CDN to come in or Comcast directly, they're not going to let us through except as best effort. And when things get really congested, that best effort can be problematic. Um, so given that interconnection is part of that network compact, what does the FCC kind of, what do you, what role should the FCC play in kind of dealing with this fight that's kind of happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I've been there. I, I understand exactly the situation that, that, um, that you're, uh, you're describing. Um, um, I don't think this is TMI, but my wife and I like to lay in bed and watch Netflix. <laughs> And it depends on what you're watching. Right? Well, well, I, <laughs> that's as much information All as right. you're going to get from me this morning. Got it. No comment. Okay. Um, and, and, and literally, why is this happening? You know, you're chairman of the FCC. Why is this happening? Yes. Uh, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, today we call interconnection peering, <laughs> all right? It's not different, it's just a new name. Peering was a, an engineering concept in the early days of the net that the engineers, as engineers are wont to do, build something that was a uh, straightforward and simple and would, would, would operate and, and, and the, the economics of it were just you know, not even close to their thinking, you know. And traffic will be exchanged and we'll all do essentially the same and it'll all be a happy ending. When it moved from an engineering concept to an economic concept, um, the engineers got patted on the head and said, thank you very much, and now how do we deal with this as, 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 as an economic gate point? And, um, and so the challenge that I think we are going through right now is you want to make sure that there is innovation. You want to make sure that there is experimentation. You want to make sure that you are allowing a network to evolve and operate and, and, and not have the kind of command and control structure that was possible in the old days. But at the same point in time, you want to make sure there are not abuses. And um, uh, we, were, we were talking before we came out here, you know, a lot of people seem to think that, that the whole peering and interconnection topic is the same as net neutrality. It's not. It's a, di it's a different issue. It's a cousin, right? It is. Maybe a sibling. <laughs> but, um, but, it's, but it's not the same issue. But I think that it is an issue that is something that, that the commission has to stay on top of that the commission will be, um, not will be, invites comments, stories, what people feel aren't abuses, fulsome debate, um, 
and that our job is to make sure that whatever happens is not anti-competitive, is not favoring one party. I, I'm the ISP, and I've got an investment in this, and therefore these guys come through faster or, 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 or whatever. Um, and, um, and, and that's the challenge that we have to apply to make sure that it is a, it is a, 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 a competitive, vibrant, non-preferential preferential market. But our job is more challenging than it was in Theodore Vale's day when you could say, thou will do that. Because we've moved to an environment where instead of having a centralized network, We've got a distributed network. Instead of the action being here at the switch, where you could have some controls, um, it, the action is now all out, out here. Um, and that changes the kind of approach that a regulator needs to, needs to take. Where well, you've got to be responsive to all the stuff that's happening out here. You've got to recognize what's going on in peering. You've got to say, how can I encourage innovation? And how can I make sure there isn't abuse? And that's. That's what makes this job interesting. I mean, the, 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 the exciting thing about this job for all five of us commissioners is that we get to sit here in the middle of this fourth great network revolution and deal with issues just like this. And, um, and, and it's something that makes you want to get up in the morning. I'm glad. Keep getting up because um, my Netflix, I really want to watch it. <laughs> um, well, we brought you, you have now brought me very gracefully, gracefully to the net neutrality issue, which peering may not be, but recently the U.S. Federal Court of Appeals did strike down your ability to, or the FCC's kind of uh, open internet order. And I know that in Silicon Valley, people are really freaked out, like Fred Wilson, who is a venture capitalist, wrote a, a wonderful blog post that it, it's like the worst case scenario, which is like a company comes and wants to deliver a service over the internet, and I'm like, nope, because did you pay the ISP? Because they're going to stop you. I, I think that's everybody's big fear, and it makes for great headlines. But let's talk about kind of what you think will happen, what you guys are looking at and then what you guys plan to do. We probably should ask you what you plan to do first, and then we'll go into the, the what ifs. It, so about the court vacating most of that decision. Well, I'm not going there yet. OK. <laughs> I figured as much. But points for asking. Um, but, but let's talk about some uh, in general. Um, Verizon went to the court and said, tell us the FCC does not have jurisdiction over the internet. And the court said, not so fast. Right. Um, and um, that's a positive good. step. Yes. The court took a look at the anti-discrimination and the non-blocking structure, not the concepts, the structure, and said, no, nah, this structure is too close to what you said this wasn't, a common carrier. Um, and we're not going to let you do it this way. But they said, but let us tell you what does work, what, what would work. Okay. Um, I have said publicly that I interpret what the court did as an invitation to us, and that I ex intend to accept that invitation. And you have said publicly, you have talked about kind of what you see happening and wanting to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm curious what you mean by that in terms of if an abuse is found, I mean, should I be filing complaints with the FCC when I'm 
when I'm tracking my packets across the network. <laughs> what, what does that mean for people who are very concerned about what might happen and possible possible blocking or? So I think what that what that means to this is not your case or Susan Ness's case or somebody else's case that we're talking about. What we're talking about is that the internet is evolving so rapidly that we want to look at case sets as well as generic concept rules, okay? So that what we don't want to do is to say that somehow we're smarter than the net. Because I can stipulate to that we aren't. It, it kind of depends on what part of the net you're on, actually. The, I, 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 you know, I will stipulate to the fact that. Um, and, um, but, but look at the cases that develop and look at them inside a construct that the court told us is what does this do for the um, expansion and growth and furtherance of the internet and add to that our consumer protection responsibilities and, um, and, and address issues in a dynamic rather than a static way. That's, I mean, don't confuse. Case by case is a dynamic approach rather than, well, this is a, everybody's got to go through the eye of this needle. And that's where, that's how we hope to approach things. Does that put you at risk or put, put all of this at risk under a different chairman or as regimes change? Well, you know, I can only take a bath in the stream that's going by, right? Um, and, um, but I do think that it is possible. And one of the things, again, that is really significant about this point in time, I do think it is possible to establish some concepts. Um, the court made its decision based around a set of concepts that were developed by one of my predecessors and have taken on a life of their own. Okay. I think it is entirely possible to have that same kind of establishing the foundation and that, that will prevail okay. over time. And you had made some comments actually in October, I think it was, about kind of the creation of a double, or it seemed to be in favor of kind of what the telcos like to call a double-sided market, which is the consumer pays for their broadband, and then something like Netflix or anybody would also pay the ISP for access to the end consumer. And I'm wondering if you wanted to add kind of a little bit of clarity behind that, because that, a lot of people look at that and they're like, gosh, that is exactly what net neutrality was designed to prevent. And then they're a little concerned. So, so first of all, you got to, as, as I know you do, you got to understand the difference between what the open internet order did for wireless versus wired. And in a wireless environment, which was what I was talking about here, um, it is, um, it, it clearly allows and encourages, in fact, this kind of this kind of. Uh, yeah, you can only cram so many bits per hertz. And and so you so so I think that you've got to so so what I was trying to say is that we believe that markets should be innovative, and at the same point in time, we are not reticent to say, excuse me, that's anti-competitive. Excuse me, that's self-dealing, um, excuse me, this is a consumer abuse, and to make those kinds of judgments. Um, and we want to encourage the dynamism, and we want to have the oversight that does two things. It enables a broad canvas that says, Basically, here's the kind of concepts we want to operate in. The paints the, has the four corners on which everybody can, can 
paint in, inside those corners. And also then gets really specific and says, no, that's anti-competitive. And again, I'm not smart enough to know what comes next. I think we are capable of saying that's not right. And there is no hesitation to do that. All right. Well, I, I'm excited. And thank you so much for spending so much time on, on basically Netflix versus the internet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we didn't get a chance to talk about education and broadband access and that sort of thing. Um, but I know you wrote a blog post on Friday. So people should. So, so uh, what is so significant about broadband, Stacy, and what really gets me pumped up is, is there's been too much time talking about broadband, 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 that it's not just broadband, it's what broadband enables. So for instance, if we can use high speed internet access to provide a 21st century education for our kids, and we don't, shame on us. And this agency has responsibility for overseeing the E-rate program. I'll tell you a story, Gigi Sohn and I, about 10 days ago, were at um, a middle school in Oakland, California. And um, we were going from classroom to classroom, and along the wall, in all the classrooms, was about a four inch conduit that had plugs, electric plugs, and ethernet ports in it about every four or five feet. And I looked at that and I said, that's the old internet in the classroom. That's when the computer was over there and you went to it. Because in this classroom, there was also a Wi-Fi router on the wall, and kids were sitting at their desks with their, in this case, Chromebooks, and they were accessing all kinds of content. And so the internet has moved, and, 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 uh, and the use of technology in schools has moved to the computer over there to the computer on the desk. With that has come incredible demands on bandwidth. The kids were telling us stories about how they would hit enter, and if it was simultaneously, everything would choke, okay? Um, they were telling us about taking their computers and walking around the room until they could get, you know, a good, a good signal. Um, and, you know, the president has said that he said back in, back in June that we need to connect 99% of the schools uh, within five years to at least 100 meg per thousand students going to a gig, yeah. okay? And, and the only thing that I would add to that is five years or less. We have responsibility through the E-rate program to fund schools. Here's the interesting thing that, that I've learned. Um, our great team uh, that, that, that we've got at the commission, John Wilkins, um, is our new managing director. Um, and uh, he came from McKinsey. And working with Julie Veach, who's the, the head of our wireline bureau, they have applied business-like cash flow management concepts to the E-rate fund that is going to enable us to double the amount of money that's going for broadband installation this year and, um, and be able to address this challenge immediately by saying we're going to take the steps to make sure that, that 21st century students get 21st century education. And, um, and that is, is, is high on the list of priorities that we have at the commission. And probably, all, you know, I, I, I agree totally with you in everything that you said about the importance of the evolving internet and what's our role in this sort of stuff. But if you really stop and think about it, the, the, the great 
challenge that we have is how do you use the internet to make sure that our most important assets, our kids, get the best possible education. And the great thing about being at the FCC is that we sit in the middle of it and we think that we've got an approach. I can't wait to see it. I've got a seven-year-old daughter, so, and she has a tablet, so it'll be great. Well, great. thank you so much. Stacy, thank you. Enjoyed it.